Hello, History One students. This is Mrs. Politsky, and I have your notes for Chapter 14, Section 2, The Spanish-American War. So we're going to get into talking about the war here in a moment, but I want to talk about yellow journalism, because it's really yellow journalism that kind of gets this war all started in the first place. So what is yellow journalism? Well, yellow journalism is sensationalist journalism. And you may want to write that down. Uh, it lacks reliable resources. It may contain fake interviews. It has lots of pictures and illustrations, which are great for people who are illiterate. Uh, there are a lot of eye-catching headlines. Some of those are kind of exaggerated. And finally, when we talk about like the Sunday comics, you know, that colored portion of Sunday newspapers, it's really the, the era of yellow journalism that brings us to the, the readers. So if you take a look at this uh, political cartoon, uh, you see this kind of behemoth of a guy. And on his belt, you might see the name Spain. He's got a lot of blood on his hands. He's got a sword that has blood as well. And as you can see, we have a gravestone. Uh, the main soldiers or sailors murdered by Spain. Um, and he's kind of stepping on the U.S. flag. All these were uh, images to incite outrage uh, by readers here in the United States. And, and for the most part, our yellow journalists did a pretty good job of getting us all worked up. So let's talk about how we get involved in Cuba here. Uh, just so you know, uh, Cuba, for the most part, was probably one of the most important uh, colonies that Spain had. And really up until about Oh, about the 1880s, uh, Spain had actually, for the most part, had kind of enslaved about a third of the Cuban population. And many of those were people who were working on sugar plantations, sugar cane plantations. So in number one, how did the United States and Cuba become closely linked economically? And part of this was the fact that Cuba exported a lot of the sugar to the United States. And on our end, we had a lot of U.S. investors. Um, Cuba wasn't just all sugar plantations, but there were mines there. Uh, there were some individuals who built railroads and, again, the sugar plantations. The problem falls in about 1894. Um, our members of Congress passed a tariff uh, that levied very, very high tariffs on goods coming into the United States. And one of the, the goods that really got hard hit was sugarcane. And for the most part, it, it pretty much decimated the Cuban economy. At the same time, there was a group of Cuban exiles who had wanted to stage uh, um, kind of a, a revolution uh, of independence uh, in that country, kind of starting in the late 1880s. And some of these exiles ended up in the United States. Uh, one of them is actually the, the name of the man that we're looking for for number two. So who led the February 1895 rebellion in Cuba? And that was a man named Jose Marte. Uh, Jose Marte uh, used this timing of this tariff. Uh, he knew that Cuba was hurting economically. They were kind of distracted. And so him and, and his fellow Cuban exiles who had been for years raising money to buy weapons and to train troops, um, they came to Spain or came back to Cuba in 1895 and staged this little war of independence. In the process, Jose is going to die. But by September of 1895, uh, for the most part, they declare Cuba independent. And this is when you have to say, not so fast. Um, the Spanish government, they were not upset or they were upset about what had happened. And they sent a new governor to Cuba who happened to be a general. His name was um, Valentino Weiler. And Weiler comes to Cuba. And for the most part, he, he kind of cracks down. And uh, what ends up happening is a lot of these rebels, if you want to call them, are going to be um, captured and, and put into reconcentration camps. So 
in these reconcentration camps, uh, there was a lot of disease and there was a lot of food. And so we had tens of thousands of men and women and children that starved or died of disease. So what caused most Americans to side with these rebels against Spain? And part of it comes from, again, the newspapers, um, stories of Spanish atrocities. Uh, Weiler was known as the butcher and uh, newspapers like the New York Journal and the New York World reported that he had done all these awful things. Uh, you got to remember newspapers, yellow newspapers like this, they love the underdog. Um and they are upset by how the underdog is being treated by Spain for the most part. So as a, as a result of this, there's this call for uh, nationalism in, in Cuba. And some of it is actually coming from the United States. There was a group of politicians uh, that were known as Jangoist. And these are individuals who are like um, totally into nationalism. Um, maybe not necessarily American nationalism, but nationalism for the, the Cuban people. And what's interesting is our president, William McKinley, not necessarily the biggest nationalist, um, but he's hearing it from a lot of his members of his cabinet. And so he eventually decides that maybe it would be in our best interest to send an envoy down to, to Cuba. And so he decides to send out the USS Maine. Uh, so why did President McKinley finally send the Maine to Cuba? And part of that was uh, in the event that American citizens might need to be evacuated. Uh, for the most part, the mission was supposed to be a goodwill mission. And so the ship was sent out and it eventually uh, it makes it to Spain or makes it to Cuba and it harbors in Havana. So in number five, where was the USS Maine when it exploded in 1898? And that would be in the harbor in Havana, Cuba. What's interesting is that our sensationalist newspapers reported that the Maine, for the most part, had been hit by a, a mine, um, a submergible mine for the most part. And um, What's interesting is after um, having concluded um, by maybe the, by the wreckage that was left, uh, that was that was what the American people were told in 1898. What's fascinating is since that period of time, uh, other investigators have come in and they've reexamined the case well after the end of the Spanish-American War. And what they have found or now know is that this was a complete accident. Uh, Spain had nothing to do with the main blowing up. What it was, was internal combustion. Um, the main was powered by coal and there was a coal bunker. And when you have coal, you have coal dust and coal dust can be pretty volatile. It can, it can cause a fire. And what's interesting is right next to the bunker where they would store all this coal to fuel the ship was what they would call the magazine. And the magazine is where you store all your ammunition. So here you have volatile coal and coal dust right next to all this explosive, explosive material with your ammunition. So a fire starts, it gets hot. It, for the most part, heats up the ammunition and it blows up. And that's really how the main um, exploded. But in 1898, that wasn't what the American people were told. They, they told it was, were told it was sabotage. So in number six, how did the Americans regard Spain at the time of this explosion? And for the most part, Americans were not really excited about the Spanish. We thought they were a bunch of thugs and tyrants. And for the most part, most Americans believed it would be right to go to war against Spain. Uh, so President McKinley in April a few months after this explosion, asked Congress for a declaration of war. And they give it to him. And almost immediately, we send ships and troops out. Um, in the Pacific, uh, we have the, an American fleet that is actually stationed in Hong Kong. And we send them to the Philippines. So who defeated the Spanish 
in the Philippines, and that would be a man named Commodore, or a.k.a. Admiral George Dewey. Uh, Dewey happened to be there. Um, the belief was if we would send our fleet to the Philippines, the Spanish, they had um, part of their naval fleet stationed there. We would just cut them off, you know, from being able to help Cuba if we would attack. Uh, at the same time, in Cuba, things were not all that peachy. Uh, you had problems with tropical diseases. So what effect did the tropical diseases have on Spanish forces in Cuba? And unfortunately, these diseases weakened the Spanish forces and left Spain pretty much unprepared to fight. Um, some of these diseases would include malaria and eventually yellow fever. And number nine, where did both sides know the war would ultimately be fought? And that would be at sea, which the war for the most part really was. So why was defeating the Spanish fleet important to the United States? As I mentioned before, this would be our opportunity to kind of cut the Spanish off uh, from resupplying their troops in Cuba. Number 11, how did the number of Americans uh, who died in training camps compared to those that were killed in battle in Cuba? And unfortunately, kind of like the Spaniards, uh, we had far more people die in camps uh, than we did in battle. And again, a lot of it is the disease. Um, when you get into tropical climates, you have a lot of problems with mosquitoes. And what's interesting is we learned a lot from fighting this war, at least as far as how to manage mosquitoes. Uh, a guy like Walter Reed, who was um, a, a doctor within the American army, um, basically came up with the protocol of how uh, to treat, um, you know, the disease. And a lot of that is how you manage the insect. Uh, he called for fumigation. He called for drainage of swamps and to get rid of standing water. And for the most part, we're going to take all those lessons and we're going to use them elsewhere in the world, primarily when we start working on the canal in Panama. Who were the Rough Riders? And well, our Rough Riders were a voluntary cavalry unit from the American West, and it was made up primarily of cowboys and miners and law enforcement officers. And their two main commanders uh, were a guy named Colonel Leonard Wood, who, by the way, his uh, very famous general eventually. Um, there is a military fort down in the state of Missouri where we train a lot of our uh, members of the U.S. Army. Um, and then the other, probably the more famous, is Theodore Roosevelt. What's interesting is this unit was supposed to be cavalry, meaning that they should have been riding on horseback. But for some reason, uh, the horses didn't show up in Cuba in time. And these men basically became an infantry unit, meaning that they were having to march up the hills. Um, supposedly, this unit is known for charging what is known as San Juan Hill. But truth is, the charge was actually of a hill called Kettle Hill that you see um, in this photograph here on the bottom left hand corner. So as the war kind of wraps up, uh, the United States had to come up with a, a formal way to, to end this conflict. And we came up with something known as the Platt Amendment. Uh, this Platt Amendment was coined by a guy named Senator uh, Orville Platt. And for the most part, it made Cuba an American protectorate. And there are four parts of this. And you may want to write some of this down. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be word for word, but kind of getting the, the big gist of the ideas. Uh, the first part of this was that Cuba couldn't make treaties with other nations that would possibly weaken their independence. Uh, the second is that uh, Cuba had to allow the United States to buy or lease naval stations in Cuba. And this is something that is still in effect. Um, Guantanamo Bay uh, has been used by the U.S. military for, for over 100 years. Uh, number three, uh, Cuba's debts had to be kept low. And part of this was to keep uh, the foreigners out from having to um, collect on the debts and using their tr uh, troops to do so. And then finally, uh, the U.S. would have the right to intervene to protect Cuban independence and to help keep order. 
Uh, just so you understand, Cuba would be an American protectorate until the 1930s. And it's at that time that we formally hand Cuba over to the Cuban people. Along with that, uh, we got to talk about the Philippines because, you know, we sent our Navy there and, and certainly there were troops there as well. And what was the main economic argument for annexing the Philippines? And the belief was that this annexation would create larger markets for American goods. Truth is, at the time that our fleet shows up in the Philippines uh, during this war, uh, there are Filipinos that are rising up and um, kind of helping with this uh, um war of independence trying to to eradicate the uh the spaniards and a guy named emilio uh and guinaldo uh is one of these patriots that's going to rise up and and try to help us uh he has a group of guerrilla um troops and once they find out that the united states is planning to annex the philippines they go from helping us to turning against us and what we're going to find is that uh, this annexation is going to actually lead to uh, what is known as the Filipino insurrection, which is basically uh, another war in the Philippines. Uh, that's going to take tens of thousands of U.S. troops to go there over a course between 1898 and 1901. It's in 1901 that Emilio um, Aguinaldo is actually captured. And when he's captured, he tells his forces to stop fighting. And so in, by uh, 1902, the fighting has stopped. And uh, supposedly, we're, we're going to find a little bit more peace. But to actually have Filipino independence, the Philippines are not going to get their independence until 1946. And this is going to be after World War II. And part of that was the fact that the Filipinos fought very um, bravely against the Japanese when the Japanese occupied uh, their islands during the course of the war. So in a way, we kind of paid them back by giving them their independence, but we still had access to military bases there well up until the 1980s. In number 15, what was the Four Acre Act and what did it mean for the Philip or Puerto Rico? And this act provided a civil government and an elected legislature. It called for a governor and an executive council. And all of these were going to be appointed by our U.S. president. Just so you know, Puerto Rico, as a result of this, becomes a territory of the United States. Uh, the people of Puerto Rico have, at times, um, gotten together to discuss the issue of statehood. But as of the moment, Puerto Rico is still a territory. It has not officially become a state. Maybe that will happen in your lifetime. In 16, how did William Howard Taft improve education, uh, transportation, and healthcare? Where was he doing this? He did this in, of all places, the Philippines. Uh, he's going to eventually be appointed the governor of the Philippines. And then eventually he's going to come back home uh, to be the vice president under Theodore Roosevelt. Thank you very much.